today by Lieutenant General um, Fruin, who is, will give an update also in relation to the vaccination program. Um, so firstly, uh, obviously everyone is looking at Sydney at the moment, uh, and for the people of Sydney, I just want to really reach out to you and recognise that this is an extremely difficult time um, and very concerning in terms of the numbers of cases that are being reported and including those uh, severe cases in intensive care and in hospital. Um, tragically today, uh, we've had our very first death uh, in Australia from a locally acquired case, a uh, woman in her 90s, I understand, a close contact uh, of other family members. I would stress this was not someone who uh, was in an aged care facility, uh, nor was it someone who had had the chance to be vaccinated. So, uh, so that is a, a terrible thing for that person, their family, and uh, certainly my condolences um, to that uh, particular family now. Um, but I, I think we, we, we can see that in increase in the cases. Uh, uh, there's some concerning signs there about still a large proportion of those uh, over 70 cases today in New South Wales uh, had been in the community whilst infectious. Um, the pleasing part is that uh, the majority of those 77 uh, cases were close contacts of, of, of known cases, uh, and the New South Wales authorities are continuing to do an extraordinary job at, at chasing down those chains of transmission, making sure that they get to those quickly, doing rapid testing, uh, getting those results and, and taking the action that is required. Um, from the Commonwealth level, we are continuing um, to meet daily in the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee, that group of chief health officers from around the country and other experts that I chair. Um, we had another meeting today. Uh, we, we've uh, gathered that information from New South Wales, given suggestions as we do, uh, and I'm in very close contact with uh, Dr Kerry Chant there in New South Wales um, uh, to give advice and to offer support uh, where that's possible. Uh, there's very practical support, of course, that's happening uh, from, from the Commonwealth uh, in relation to the situation in Sydney, uh, and that includes, uh, because that is a Commonwealth-designated hotspot, there is, uh, there is funding available for, uh, for aged care, for example, uh, in terms of single-site worker payments. There is the, uh, the, disaster, uh, the COVID disaster payment, which is also available now for, for people that are eligible in, in Sydney. Um, there is a whole range of other supports that's going uh, into aged care, including um, our, our teams uh, doing uh, testing within in-reach testing into aged care facilities, as well as uh, as vaccina offering vaccination to those that may not have taken that up on the on the first and second round of in-reach vaccination. Um, so that that is all happening, um, and we're continuing to to talk closely with the New South Wales authorities about what anything else that they might need. Um, so the specific message to Sydney today is the same as you've received from, uh, from Dr Chan earlier, earlier uh, in terms of what you need to do. This is a time for staying at home. Please do not look for a loophole in, in what that messaging might be. The message is, unless you have to absolutely leave the house for an essential reason, and they're all listed on the New South Wales website, they've been talked about every day, we've talked about essential reasons for 18 months. Do not leave your home. This virus does not move by itself. It moves with people. And it's when people are mixing uh, that uh, is when the virus spreads. Uh, we know that this, at this moment there are uh, an, a large number of people with uh, COVID-19 in uh, Sydney. Uh, the assumption should be that if you are leaving the house that you may be the person that has COVID-19. The people that you mix with may be people that have COVID-19. This is a risky time for Sydney. We need to take those messages very clearly and carefully, uh, and that means stay at home unless you absolutely need to go out. The other completely important part of that message is if you are asked to get a test, get that test as soon as quickly, uh, as soon as possible. Uh, if you are, have even the most minimal of symptoms, get a test. Uh, these, are the, these are the ways we will be able to chase down those chains of transmission block them and stop that spread. Uh, the vir virus does move with people. Um, the third uh, uh, clear message is we can all get COVID-19 and some of us, as we've seen in, in Sydney in, in recent days, can get severe illness. So this is not a time for complacency. Uh, it's not a time for frustration. It's a time for actually 
recognising that and taking that responsibility and for yourself, your family and the community. Um, on that basis, there will be uh, a new ad that will be running from an uh, advertisement from the Australian government tonight. It's quite graphic. Um, we're only doing this because of the situation in Sydney. It will be running in Sydney. Uh, and the messages will be clear. Um, uh, stay at home, get tested and book in for a vaccination. There are, there are the three messages on that ad. Um, so watch out for, for that. It is quite graphic and, and, and it's meant to be graphic. It is meant to really um, push that message home that this is important. Uh, my final thing before I hand over to, uh, to General Fruin is uh, in relation to Summit uh, Aged Care in Borkham Hills. Uh, this is where there is an active uh, um, outbreak in that, in that uh, aged care facility. There is a lot of work that's, that is going on from the Commonwealth in conjunction with uh, New South Wales Health and the local public health unit as well as Westmead Hospital. There are six residents that have been uh, removed from that uh, uh, that facility and transferred to hospital for their for their best care as well as to protect the residents um, of that aged care facility. Uh, five of those six were fully vaccinated. Unfortunately, the sixth one was not, and I can report that she is quite unwell uh, at the moment, seriously unwell uh, in hospital. Um, there are uh, and there are some uh, some aged care workers that have been involved in that outbreak, but that is under control. It's not spreading through through the uh, summit aged care, mostly mostly due to the very high vaccination rate, uh, two doses of Pfizer vaccine in that facility, as well as all of the very strong uh, work that's being done uh, with extra workforce, 130 workforce that have come in uh, through the Commonwealth mechanisms, as well as PPE and other infection control procedures. Um, so I will um, leave it there and, and pass on to uh, General Fruin and then we'll, I'll come back for questions. Thanks, Professor. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, like Professor Kelly, uh, the members of the Vaccination Task Force are monitoring the situation uh, in New South Wales very carefully and we are also working closely with the authorities there. Uh, but today I also wish to make uh, another announcement. You've heard me speak a lot about uh, vaccine supply, uh, distribution and administration in recent weeks. Uh, today I really want to focus on the communications around the vaccination uh, and the important message that we need Australians to get vaccinated uh, as quickly as possible. And today I have launched the next iteration of the communications campaign. Uh, it's the Arm Yourself campaign uh, and materials uh, have already started to run uh, on billboards, in social media, and you will soon start to hear them on radio and see them on TV. Uh, the Arm Yourself campaign uh, really seeks to rally Australians to both arm themselves and to arm their friends, loved ones and communities against COVID-19 through vaccination. Uh, the materials will be adapted for culturally uh, diverse groups uh, and for Indigenous communities. Uh, and they will be translated into many languages. And we will continue to adapt the products uh, as we go uh, through the rollout through this year. This, uh, I must urge, is not the entire campaign. The Arm Yourself campaign is but another phase of this. Uh, and we will be continuing to adapt the campaign uh, as we learn more about how the rollout is progressing uh, and as we learn more about areas we need to emphasise in particular. Uh, in line with that, I do encourage all Australians to please go and uh, book your vaccinations as soon as you can if you haven't already done so. But please, I also ask people to be patient uh, as we still seek to bring uh, more vaccines online. Uh, Professor Kelly has noted that there will also be uh, a separate ad to the Arm Yourself campaign running in Sydney tonight. Uh, he's mentioned that it is uh, a graphic and confronting ad. That is very much about the specific circumstances in Sydney right now. Uh, stressing to the residents of Sydney uh, the importance of staying home, of getting tested if necessary, and booking your vaccinations. Uh, that ad uh, will run very specifically in Sydney. Uh, meanwhile, Arm Yourself will be running uh, right across the country uh, and again encouraging all of us to uh, protect ourselves, our friends and families, and our communities. Thank you. Lieutenant General, on the ads, the Arm Yourself campaign it doesn't explicitly mention the risks of COVID or even explicitly the benefits of being able to protect yourself, your loved ones, in terms of what you're protecting them from. 
given the concern is that the majority of Australians are a bit relaxed about the risk to themselves of COVID, is that campaign going to be enough? And why only target this sort of scarier version at Sydney where the, the lockdown is now, given it could be another city, another time? Why not take that approach nationally? Yeah, so uh, there have been uh, a range of other materials uh, available uh, for many months now around uh, both uh, the risks of COVID uh, and the efficacy of the vaccines. Uh, we will continue to provide those materials on the risks of COVID and uh, the efficacy of both the vaccines we have available at the moment. Uh, right now, we think it's time to, to help just lift the community's uh, you know, awareness that this, this is both an individual thing and a community thing. So that's what Arm Yourself is really about, is just bringing a bit more of a, uh, a community spirit to the idea of getting vaccinated. Uh, and again, I've said we'll, we'll continue to adapt the campaign. Uh, we'll continue to provide that other more factual information as we go. Uh, and when circumstances necessitate it, like we think they do in Sydney right now, uh, we will uh, help people understand the very dire potential consequences of COVID um, and, and help to uh, bring a greater sense of urgency to those areas where we need to. Why did you not opt, I guess, for a more flashy ad? I mean, it's been described quite a few people today as a bit plain. Yep. The other day you said, go back to the drawing board. Other countries, Singapore, New Zealand, we've seen celebrities and song and dances and that sort of thing. Was there a specific reason you didn't go for that sort of type of ad? Yeah, as I've said, this is just another a next phase of the campaign, and we are going to build the campaign progressively towards the end of the year. Uh, you'd be aware from the materials that I've released that it's really October, November and December when we have the, uh, you know, the, the vast amounts of vaccine coming through. So, so we do wish to build up through the year. Uh, Arm Yourself will, over the next month or so, be adapted to help bring in the community and uh, get the community to start participating. It's very tailorable to specific regions, uh, specific language and cultural groups, as I've mentioned. Uh, but I do anticipate that you will see those sorts of things that you uh, have highlighted there later in the year. So is this essentially admission that you can't be encouraging everyone to rush because there aren't quite enough vaccines for everyone to do that yet and will you be having more talks internationally about sourcing extra vaccines as has been suggested today? So uh, we are constantly working to uh, bring forward vaccines where we can. Uh, you will have seen last week, uh, a few weeks ago we were getting 300,000 doses of Pfizer a week into the country. Uh, in the next few weeks, that will go to uh, around about a million doses a week. So that's a, a very significant increase. That's bringing forward of doses that we did have ordered that we were anticipating later in the year. That's a very positive development. It's been very uh, welcomed by the jurisdictions. Uh, that will help people get access to Pfizer earlier. Uh, as uh, to the uh, materials, I think it's very appropriate that we progressively build a campaign uh, to the later months in the year when we're then more fully aware of exactly who has come forward to get vaccinated, and we then need to tailor products to help get those sort of uh, latter groups of Australians who may have been a bit slower to get vaccinated or a bit more hesitant to get vaccinated. We can really start to tailor the campaign then. How involved was the Prime Minister in the Arm Yourself campaign that's gone out today? The, um, the campaign itself has gone through all of the usual government approval processes. Um, the, the Prime Minister is aware of the materials, but it's, it's worked through the normal processes that the campaign would go through. Professor Kelly, could you speak to the epidemiology of the outbreak in Sydney insofar as this huge uptick in cases is expected to continue? What are your key concerns? And is it time to see things like door-to-door -door testing in those suburbs or areas that are particularly producing a lot of cases? Um, so uh, we need to understand the nature of a virus. Um, the, the way I've described it to uh, friends and family today is that uh, the vi virus is like water in a leaky shower. That it will find its way um, in, in, in this way um, into the community uh, and, and it will really sort of just keep moving. I think the specific issues that are happening in, in southwest southwest Sydney is, uh, appears to be uh, associated with large family groups in multiple houses and then uh, and they uh, with many of the members of those households working in essential work uh, workplaces. Um, uh, construction has been specifically mentioned, um, uh, but uh, uh, they are out in the community. And so that is the reason why it is, it is spreading um, uh, in, in those areas. 
Now, what, what, uh, how that can be uh, looked at, and I know that New South Wales Health has, uh, has talked about this, is actually uh, increasing the, the testing availability to those particular workplaces of concern. Uh, they're reaching in, uh, in, in many different ways into the, the multicultural community of South West Sydney in particular, where, uh, where there is you know, extraordinary and wonderful um, uh, groups of family groups that are very closely uh, associated with themselves, and in normal times, that's a that is a, a good thing. But these are not normal times, and so that message really is: uh, stay within your own house, stay within your own family in that house, uh, and don't uh, go out. Professor Kelly, uh, today Nicole Chant in New South Wales, uh, Kerry Chant, sorry, has. Uh, stress that people should get their second dose of AstraZeneca as soon as possible rather than waiting for the 12 weeks. Can we get some clarification from a Commonwealth point of view what the recommendation is? So, so we have a national program and um, I'll, I'll go to uh, uh, General Fruin in a moment about, about the national program and how, those, how that program is working. And so the advice from the TGA as, a, as early as January this year is that there is a range of, of, of times that you can get that second dose of AstraZeneca between four and 12 weeks. That is, that is licensed for that use. We know from the clinical trials and real world experience in other parts of the world, particularly the UK, that the longer you wait for that second dose at, at, at 12 weeks seems to be the optimal time to get that for longer term protection. And so that remains the national uh, program uh, and the national advice. In Sydney right now, um, we need to weigh up uh, immediate protection versus longer term protection. And so that immediate protection that would come from an earlier dose uh, would, would make sense. And, and uh, Dr Chant did actually mention that today. I know that she's been in discussion with the ATAGI group overnight. Um, ATAGI, the, the medical experts in relation to vaccination, are meeting weekly to specifically look at AstraZeneca, the risk benefit analysis. Uh, in relation to that, and so they'll have some advice on that uh, specifically later in the week. Um, uh, but for now, uh, I, I would I would join them in saying, if you're in Sydney, only in, only in Sydney, uh, then have a discussion with your with your GP to bring, potentially bring that forward. But that's a, a kind of one-on-one -on -one discussion about that risk and benefit of that. Sorry, did, sorry, did, just, just on that, what would be the number that you would say? Would you say that people should start talking to their GP around the eight-week mark? I think Kerry Chant mentioned six potentially today. What would be your um, thought there? And you mentioned there about a target, and obviously that recommendation uh, around second doses and that sort of thing. Obviously, the recommendation is 12 weeks, but mm. could we see that? I know you're not one of target, but could we see that potentially change? Maybe that national advice becomes eight weeks or something like that? So that would be a matter for Atagi, obviously, and as you say, I'm not on that on that group specifically, but I do talk to them. Um, the the issue the issue is that risk and benefit, right? So at the moment, anyone outside of Sydney, stick with the 12 weeks. That's a pretty clear um, uh, thing for the national picture. For those in Sydney, um, it is licensed from four to 12 weeks, and so they should have that discussion with their GP. Uh, we'll, we'll be uh, talking with New South Wales Health, and, and I'm sure they'll be uh, talking uh, more broadly in Sydney itself. But um, earlier gives you less protection longer term, but it gives you protection, better protection now. That two doses is really important. Anyone who's due for a second dose, please do not hesitate. If you had AstraZeneca first, get that second AstraZeneca. Uh, and uh, similarly with the Pfizer doses. Two doses with this Delta um, variant is, is particularly important to protect against severe illness uh, and indeed even more mild illness, which would assist with, the, um, with, with stopping the spread. Did you want to add anything? Uh, General, for us, on the aged care rollout, do you have an update <coughs> on how many aged care staff have been vaccinated with first and second doses? And do you also have a number on the number of aged care providers who have been to vaccinate their own staff? Uh, look, more than a third of aged care workers now have had their first dose. Uh, I don't have those other figures that you've referred to, uh, but we are, we are working with aged care uh, now. Uh, we're very focused on getting not only the, the residents uh, continual access to vaccines, but we are absolutely prioritising aged care workers. Uh, there are multiple avenues now open to aged care workers. Um, aged care workers are being given priority for bookings. They can access Pfizer. 
Um, there is now uh, protocols with the aged care facilities around people who will be visiting aged care facilities and how that might be managed by both the, the facilities. Uh, the facilities are looking now at new residents coming into the, the centres. This is, this is right at the top of the, the concerns that I have at the moment and we are, we are looking at every possible avenue to make sure that aged care is as safe as it can be. allocation is potentially being brought forward, do we have enough of those GPs that have transitioned to be able to utilise those full one million or so doses a week? Or if not, where else will we, will they go to the state clinics? Where oh no, absolutely. So we uh, we have already allocated the, uh, the bring forward of the Pfizer to both states and territories and the GPs. Uh, you'd be aware that uh, almost 500 GPs were brought on last week. We've got another 500 coming on next week, another 300 towards the end of the month. Um, between the states and the GPs, there is absolutely no concern that all of that Pfizer uh, will be administered. I might just uh, go to the people online here. Uh, Richard, you there? Oh, thank you, Lieutenant General. And um, back on to you, Ed, how many of the 300,000 doses meant for South West Sydney um, are now on the ground? And just for Professor Kelly, does he agree with Gladys Berger's claim that we're going to see Cases in New South Wales tipped to over 100 a day in the next week. Yeah, no, those uh, those doses have been bought for for delivery uh, through next week and into the week after. Uh, but I've been speaking closely with New South Wales authorities, and they will be brought into play uh, with absolute priority into South West Sydney, West Sydney, um, and South Eastern Sydney. But I'll, I'll pass to Professor Kelly. Uh, so, in terms of, of numbers, uh, look, I'm not going to speculate on what the numbers are. New South Wales Health know uh, what they're finding on the ground. I think, in, in fact, at this point in the, in the epidemic, I would welcome higher numbers. Uh, finding people is the most important thing. Finding them quickly and making sure that they are not out in the community and potentially spreading it further is the important thing. So, as has been stressed in, in, uh, by, by the Premier and uh, Dr Chand uh, in recent days, uh, you've got to look behind the numbers. That's the important uh, component of this. So large numbers themselves, yes, they're worrying. Uh, what we want to see is a decrease in the number of people that are, uh, are, are out in the community and potentially infectious in the community whilst infectious. Um, so that's the important component. Uh, the fact that they're finding most, most of the people at the moment are close contacts is also a real demonstration that they're doing that contact tracing, getting to people quickly, and that is a, a positive development. So uh, yes, I also expect larger numbers, uh, and I hope that they will start to fall soon, recognising that um, the, what the numbers we see today really reflects what was happening in the community, community a week or two weeks ago. Uh, and so we know that we've, we, there's been further lockdowns during that period, uh, further advice um, uh, over the last couple of days, and that will, that will I, I'm sure, take good effect on this, on this uh, type of outbreak. We've seen that before. We saw that in, 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 in several other outbreaks in Australia, uh, that that can be successful. But it absolutely relies on people um, hearing the message clearly, staying at home, and only going out for absolutely essential reasons and getting tested. I've um, got Pablo from uh, SBS News. Uh, thanks, Professor Kelly. My question to uh, Lieutenant General Fruin, um, and apologies if you've already answered this, but how much is this phase... A participant has left the group call. And you mentioned um, that the ads will be translated into, into different languages. Is there going to be, do you anticipate in the next phases there being an actual specific strategy targeting culturally and linguistically diverse communities? I'm sorry, Pablo, the first part of your question was interrupted then. Could you just repeat the first part? Oh, yes. The first part was just um, how much is this phase of the campaign actually going to cost? Yeah, so this... Uh, this campaign is part of the overall amount that's been allocated of 40 million for this uh, financial year. Oh, sorry, for this year. So this isn't an additional cost. It's part of that campaign rollout. Uh, as to the uh, specific tailoring of campaigns, uh, we already do have some that are being worked uh, for uh, Indigenous and remote communities. And of course, the states and territories themselves have 
campaigns as well, uh, but this will really be more a process of just uh, continual refinement, particularly as we get further through the year where we highlight areas that need um, additional focus. General Broome, do we expect any advice that come from the United States, and are we in any discussions with the US authorities about the provision of more funding? Like it's been Anthony Albanese called to that earlier today. Yeah, look, the government is constantly uh, in uh, both uh, negotiations with Pfizer uh, and uh, looking for other opportunities for sourcing of uh, Pfizer. And of course, we, uh, we do also have the Moderna uh, vaccine due to arrive later in the year as well. So constantly ongoing. Um, as soon as we know about any uh, possible additionals, we'll uh, be sure to let you know. Will there be any update to numbers in the Horizons document? I think the PM said yesterday, uh, on Friday, that there might be. And also, is planning underway on workforce um, numbers for when the rollout hits the majority of the population later in the year? Yeah, so we are we are updating the Horizons document uh, as we speak. We've already uh, indicated to the states and territories the increased amounts that they can anticipate, uh, particularly through July and out to the end of August. Um, and we will uh, we'll be making some modifications to that supply document now because we do know what we will have for August, so we, we can have a a fixed sort of average amount for August, and then what you'll still see in September is the range we anticipate, and then you'll still see the range we anticipate for October to November. Uh, and on workforce, both during the war game that I had with the states and territories this week, um, and then at the uh, forum that we had with industry with the Treasurer, uh, workforce is, uh, is a very key consideration at the moment. Um, and as I've said before, we're looking at all of the options about how we need to uh, potentially bring on either latent workforce that's already out there or, or to, to raise additional workforce. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure if you could have to but on the, the quite graphic ad that will be airing tonight, um, obviously there's been some you know, comparisons made to previous uh, public health campaigns like the um, Green Reaper ad for HIV AIDS. Is that kind of the vibe that we're seeing? Obviously, it'll be on TV in a few hours' time, but what's the sort of inspiration? What's the sort of feel of this ad that we're going to be seeing? The ad tonight, uh, very graphically depicts the consequences of uh, uh, getting COVID um, and leaves people in no doubt of the importance of both uh, isolating, getting tested and getting vaccinated. Uh, Professor Kelly, I understand the government is considering what support might be needed in terms of mental health uh, services for people in Sydney now potentially facing quite a long lockdown. Are you able to provide any information about that or what is already available, any advice to people in Sydney now who might be feeling quite upset and distraught about the figures they've seen in the last couple of days? Yeah, sure. Look, as I said right at the beginning, you know, really my heart goes out to people in Sydney. I have family and many friends in Sydney, so this is a difficult time. Um, uh, throughout the pandemic, we've had very large um, investments in, in, in strengthening mental health supports uh, right throughout Australia and specifically in, in, uh, in Melbourne and other parts of Victoria last year when they were going through this, uh, uh, this type of outbreak, recognising it was... Uh, it went for longer and much higher rates of cases. We hope we won't get to that. Um, but these these are disruptive times to recognise that. Certainly, certainly that issue of mental health support and specific uh, mental health support in Sydney is being currently contemplated. It'll be a decision for government, obviously, what that plays out. But there'll, I'm sure there'll be more discussions about that in coming days. Professor Kelly, is there a case for the Victorian government to close the Victorian border or have a hard border? And is that something that has been or will be discussing? So um, border closures is, is a matter for the state governments, for the internal border closures, closures of Australia. Um, our, our general sense is that we don't support it from the Commonwealth, but we can understand uh, the, uh, again, you know, as per the previous question, Victorians remember last winter and they want to make sure that they, uh, they are protected. That's a matter, of course, for the elected government of, of Victoria to consider. Um, it's, it's not an easy thing to do to close the border with New South Wales. There are many, many places of, of, uh, that people can cross that border. So I'm sure it will be a decision not taken lightly if it question, happened. But, but Senator mm. General, um, today we've seen some formal confirmation that we're out of Afghanistan. As someone who commanded troops there, your reflections, and do you think we achieved what we set out to? Look, I'm, uh, I'm very focused on the vaccine rollout now. Uh, very uh, many men and women and other Australians served in Afghanistan. Um, uh, I think we achieved uh, a great deal while we were there. We brought a lot of uh, hope 
um, to many Afghans and I, uh, my thoughts are with them in this difficult time, but this is now a, a matter for Afghanistan to resolve. And I do uh, just want to finish on uh, reminding all Australians to please to go and get vaccinated, to arm yourselves against COVID. Uh, arm yourselves, arm your family, arm your friends and arm your communities and book to get vaccinated at the earliest opportunity. Thank you.